Good morning, everyone. Today we'll be diving into the teachings of our Guru Paramahansa Yogananda to see how we might recognize and use the instrument of our will to not only accomplish what is practical and necessary in our lives, but most importantly, that we might attain the divine purpose for which we have been placed on this earth, and that is to realize and know ourselves as a spark, an almighty spark of that same infinite power. So please stand, and as we always do, let's begin with an opening prayer to invoke that power and blessing in our lives to help us with all our human endeavors. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, Father, Mother, Mother, Friend, friend, Beloved God, God, Jesus Christ, Christ, Bhagavan Bhagavan Krishna, Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, and our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, help us to unite our will with your divine will, to unite our love with your infinite love, and to unite our life with your omnipresence. Om. Peace. Amen. Please be seated. Welcome again, and, and especially for anyone who may be here for the first time. First, as we always do, we'll begin with the period of meditation, which is at the core of our Guru's teachings because as he taught, it is the most profound and direct way to attune our life with God's life, our will with that divine will, our love with that infinite love. Because at our core we are already those things. It's just that because of our uh, daily life and activities and the inevitable identification with this physical form, we're not always so aware of of those divine attributes of our nature. You know, when when we feel hot or cold or or later on when we, if we, you know, once that our favorite food hits our palate, in that moment it's, it's not always that we're thinking of the soul and, or even why that's necessary, because we just, it's so, this instrument that God has created is so fantastic, it's so marvelous, but it's also so compelling, so hypnotic, so absorbing. But as soon as we still this form and take our awareness, our attention away from the surface of the body and start to turn that attention within, then we begin to feel uh, those other, that eternal, that infinite part of our nature that gives expression to this form. We feel that peace within us, that happiness that we're seeking, that deeper love that we long for. Our guru said once, meditation is nothing more than remembering who we really are. And I love this Uh, saying from the book of Psalms that's uh, very well known. It says, be still and know that I am God. And really it's such a a yogic definition of meditation, to be still and know, to feel God's presence once we are still. And so the way to become still is to first sit in the meditation posture. So So as we begin our meditation to still this form, it helps to sit in the meditation posture. So if you can, with the spine straight, chin 
parallel to the floor. The hands with the palms upturned at the juncture of the thigh and abdomen, which helps to pull the shoulder slightly back. And that allows for the chest to expand in a natural way, allows for the breathing to flow in a rhythmic and natural fashion. Then in this physical posture, close the eyes and then lift the gaze gently to that point between the eyebrows. What our guru called the Christ Consciousness Center. And it's amazing, as soon as we lift our gaze to this point, it's almost as if magically the thoughts begin to disappear. That magnetic pull at this spiritual center helps draw us away from this physical form and the outer world to that inner world of peace and joy that starts to open up before our inner gaze. And then to help prepare the mind further for this inner environment of meditation, let's affirm together a few times, repeat after me. Again, gazing into this point between the eyebrows, opening our hearts, repeat after me. I am peace, I am love, I am joy, I am peace, I am love, I am joy, I am peace, I am love, I am joy. Now just mentally to ourselves, let's keep affirming Silently, mentally, I am peace, I am love, I am joy. Trying to feel that vibration of peace, love and joy within us, in our hearts. I am peace, I am love, I am joy. Now let us take that perception deeper. Let us chant one of our Guru's chants. I am the bubble, make me the sea. Again, trying to feel with each repetition of the words of the chant. The reality of who we really are. Thou and I never apart. Wave of the sea. Dissolve in the sea. I am the bubble. Make me the sea. And through chanting, we can awaken the yearning of our heart to feel and to connect with that divine presence and all-powerful presence and will of the divine. So do thou, my Lord, so do thou, my Lord, thou and I never apart, thou and I never apart, wave of the sea dissolve in the sea, wave of the sea dissolve in the sea. I am the bubble, make me the sea. 
I am the bubble, make me the sea. So do thou, my Lord. So do thou, my Lord. Thou and I never apart. Thou and I never apart. Wave of the sea dissolve in the sea. Wave of the sea, dissolve in the sea. I am the bubble, make me the sea. Oh, I am the bubble, make me the sea. Oh, make me the sea. Oh, make me the sea. Make me the sea. Oh, make me the sea. I am the bubble, make me the sea. I am the bubble. Oh, make me the sea, so do thou, my Lord, so do thou, my Lord, O oh, thou and I never apart, thou and I never apart, a wave of the sea dissolve in the sea. The wave of the sea dissolve in the sea. I am the bubble, make me the sea. I am the bubble, make me the sea. Oh, make me the sea, make me the sea, make me the sea. Oh, make me the sea. I am the bubble, make me the sea. I am the bubble, make me the sea. Oh, I am the bubble, make me the sea. I am the bubble, make me the sea. And continue to Gaze lovingly, longingly at that point between the eyebrows. At the same time, open our hearts to try to feel that inner presence as we become still.
Well, our subject today is entitled, Uniting Our Will with God's Infinite Power. So it's obviously quite a bold and thrilling concept. And I thought maybe the best place to begin is to continue with this thought that we are that already, that God's power is our power, that there is only one power in the universe and in all living things, that we couldn't lift a finger without that power, I couldn't speak without that power, our hearts couldn't beat without that power. Everything that moves and is animated and that is alive is because of that one power throughout the universe and all things. And this is reflected in our Guru's definition of the term self-realization that makes up a large part of the name that he gave his organization. And our guru defined this term as follows. He said, self-realization is the knowing in body, mind, and soul that we are one with the omnipresence of God, that we do not have to pray that it come to us, that we're not merely near it at all times. But he said that God's omnipresence is our omnipresence, that we are just as much a part of him now as we ever will be. All we have to do, he said, is improve our knowing. And I often think of it like a fish in the ocean swimming around who one day says to his little fish companions, where's all this water that everyone's talking about? And I think in the same way, we we just don't see it. We we don't realize. Again, that's the great value of meditation or or any time that we still ourselves. If we go out in nature, we just relax. We relax. We start to feel, we start to sense, we start to realize something beyond the outer manifestation of that power only. And so in a very real sense, this awareness or knowing is more or only a question of degree, not of kind. We, we, have, we feel love, we know what love is. Like the saints, we want to have more love. We, we have felt peace. We, No, we've been happy, we are happy, we feel happiness. But we want to have that, uh, increase those uh, experiences of love and joy and happiness that we already feel, but that we want more of, that will enrich our life even more to the degree that we can feel and manifest more of that in our lives. And so the point I'd like to suggest as to why we want to even bother to unite our will with God's infinite power, so that we can use that surcharged will to attain those inner lasting divine qualities. And by doing so to find the fulfillment of the love and happiness that we're really seeking in everything that we do. I think it's safe to say that, you know, if we strip away all the uh, ambitions that are all wonderful and noble, but we want to feel safe, we want to be happy, we want to feel love. And so those are, those are the only things basically that any religion has ever attempted to offer to those who would follow. That feeling of security, no matter what the conditions of life are, that promise of joy and happiness and love that, that we dare to dream about, but that in searching within, we know that that dream can come true and then we find that in a greater way without. Perhaps when we, or any of us, or myself, hear this title, uniting our will with God's infinite power, we might think, oh, if I had that power, think of all the great things I could do, I could accomplish, which again is, is instinctive in a, in a natural and noble way. But the real use 
or benefit of that increased power again is, is for all the great things we could be or become. You know, with that power, we can become a better parent. We can become a better friend, a better spouse, you know, a, a happier, more fulfilled, better human being. Some of you might have watched a recent online offering uh, of our president, Brother Chidananda, where the subject was achieving your material and spiritual goals. It was a talk he gave at our convocation some years back. And if you saw it as it relates to our subject today, you recall that how he explained the only real material or spiritual goal is a spiritual one. To know ourselves, again, as that spark of the infinite of the almighty power of God. Because as the Bible says, knowing that, then all other things are added unto us. And again, not m- merely meaning those outer things, which again are, are uh, you know, we're meant to cherish, we need to develop according to our role, our circumstances in life. But again, most importantly, I would suggest, are those gifts of the spirit that make us into what we truly want to be. And so that we can bring the best of ourselves to whatever life circumstances are or to, to the others that uh, share that journey with us. And those are the only gifts that we'll take with us when we uh, close these mortal eyes and leave the shores of this earth. Just who we are, what we've become, that, and those qualities of, of uh, love and happiness and joy. Our guru once shared a charming story and a vision he had once about this difference between the outer and inner, where he said, in my early years of traveling and lecturing throughout the West, I was often struck by the contrast between the practice of religion as I learned it from God-knowing sages in India and the customary Western approach. And he said, God once showed me an illustrative vision. In one place, there stood an immense temple resplendent with marble decorations in a skyscraper golden dome, comfortably seating a congregation of 10,000. Its walls echoed with organ music and a glorious choir chanting hymns to God. It was all impressive and enjoyable, and I appreciated it and admired it. Then he said, God showed me sitting in meditation under a tree, beneath a canopy of free skies with only a few true souls. His light was passing through all of us. God God asked me which I would prefer, the magnificent church without him or the tree temple with him. Without question, I chose to be under the tree enwrapped in God. But then our guru said, he laughed, however, when I countered that some big buildings would be necessary for his work and that he could be in them as well as under the tree. And I think this is truly our case here as well, that God is here in this, in this large building. We don't have to be. It's, again, where our hearts and souls are. That's where, that's where the divine is. So let's turn now to the scripture readings for today, first from the Christian Bible and then from the Hindu Bible, the Bhagavad Gita, these two scriptures that our guru particularly drew from, in which he used to show the universality of these principles in all lives and in all true religions. So today the passage is from St. Mark, and it reads, And he went forward a little and fell on the ground and prayed that if it were possible, the hour might pass from him. And he said, Abba, Father, all things are possible unto thee. Take away this cup from me. Nevertheless, not what I will, but what thou wilt. And it reminded me this passage of, uh, of uh, this beloved American author, Mark Twain. I remember him saying once that he said, I am not troubled by the passages in the Bible that I don't understand. He said, I am bothered by the ones that I do understand. And this, I think, would be one that would bother him. And that may make all of us a little uncomfortable until we, again, realize why uniting our will with God's plan for our life is really 
the, the greatest use uh, that we could uh, use for, for that instrument of will. And so our guru commented as follows. He said, Jesus entreated God, Abba, Almighty Father, you can do all things. As your child, O beloved Father, I pray that if it be possible, according to your laws, and if you are willing, remove this cup of trial, so bitter for my consciousness to experience. But despite my wish to avoid this terrible ordeal, let not my will, but your will be done. And our guru goes on and says, Jesus endearingly prays to the transcendental father hidden behind the etheric walls of heaven, just as a favorite son in an earthly family would trustfully entreat his father, heavenly father, as you can do everything, why not take this cup of crucifixion from me? But even as he prayed to be spared from the tyrannical workings of cosmic delusion, Jesus recognized the promptings of inner weakness and immediately added, nevertheless, let not my human will, fearful to meet the trial, be granted. Let your wisdom-guided will find fulfillment in my life. And our guru further explains, many persons misunderstand Jesus' saying, not my will, but thine be done. He never advised that God's children should renounce their soul-endowed independence of will and become unthinking mechanical tools, like a hammer that stays where it is put until picked up and wielded by the builder. Jesus' example, rather, showed that man is to use his God-given freedom to consciously choose to exercise his will in seeking to fulfill the Lord's wishes on earth. By cooperation with the divine will, man permits into his life the ready and waiting inflow of God's wisdom, power, love, joy. Jesus had taught his disciples to beseech the Father, thy will be done in earth as it is in heaven. And our guru goes on, to attune one's error-prone human will to God's will is to abide in the freedom and joy of an inner heaven on earth. And our guru concludes and says, it was when Jesus found his will being sorely tempted and temporarily swayed by mortal pangs of delusion that he uttered the above prayer. He thus used his free will to shake off delusion and be guided only by the wisdom of the will of the Father. And so this is an even deeper, or in an even deeper way, this same point is made that the the greatest reason to attune our will with God's infinite power so that we might tune in with his plan for our lives. Because as our guru explained, that plan brings peace, wisdom, joy, love. But I was thinking it, it has value to hit the, you know, just to step back, to stay with this, to hit the pause button, so to speak, for a second on this passage, and recall that the events that Jesus was referring to is his impending trial and betrayal and crucifixion, not just anything coming into his life, not just any cup that he was needing to drink. And then if we fast forward and and go to the events how when on the cross he proclaimed in that moment how if he just prayed to the Father how he could summon legions of angels to destroy his oppressors so that he would not have to. Another way that he could avoid drinking from that cup. And so here he was, is the, the, the greatest, the most powerful being in the universe, able to, to operate, manipulate the natural laws, to, to uh, walk on water, to feed all of us with a loaf of bread, to, to raise the dead, to resurrect his own physical form at will. In fact, our guru said once, Jesus Christ did not go to college, yet not one among the world's great scientists knows of God and nature's laws as he knew. And I was just reflecting, you know, there are so many of these superhero movies out uh, right now, and, you know, where the various protagonists just blast whatever is 
uh, in front of them that uh, vaporize everything around them. And so Christ could have done the same and much more. And I was thinking too, I was imagining when he uttered those words, uh, that uh, how if he so chose in that instant, he could summon legions of angels. I was just thinking there must have been just the sheer, the, the truth of those words must have vibrated uh, at that moment and, and probably froze the, uh, everybody was there for a moment to see if he was going to indeed do that or not. But then what happened? What happened was, as we know, our guru, what our guru called Christ's greatest miracle, when, as our master said, he uttered, when the magic wand of his voice uttered, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What was his greatest miracle? It was forgiveness. It was, it was not using that infinite power. Or, or in a sense, we might say, he actually used God's greatest power, that power of love, that power of forgiveness. And it's, it's beyond, really, I think, our comprehension of, of the type of will, of, of self-control not to use that power, not to respond in that way. It's the only way that, that these great ones, you know, could have those powers, that ability is if they have the means not to use those, those powers, unlike the, the superheroes that just blast away. And again, I was thinking, or if just for a moment, what, what, if, what if Christ had used that power at his command? Like those so-called superheroes. I was thinking, well, you know, what would we, how, how would we think of him down through the ages? I, I think we'd, we'd be in awe. We'd, we'd uh, uh, realize, wow, you know, how powerful he is, how, um, look what he can do, but, but I think there'd be some fear involved. It would be like, you know, there'd be, we'd have some separation. It'd be like, don't, you know, don't get him angry, kind of, you know, don't. There, there's, a, there's a line, and we don't know where that line is, so watch out. But because he didn't react that way, instead responded in the most beautiful and divine and and God-inspired way, we run to him. It's the opposite. We we want to run into his arms because, again, we know total safety. And everything that we long for, that, that in his embrace, that love, that forgiveness, that also each one of us is, is wanting to be sure of, that we have, and that we'll find in those arms. And so it's, it's just the opposite that everything we want is in that, in those arms, in that embrace. Because he uses the great, he wields the greatest force of all, that, that force of love that, again, we're made in that image. That's why that's what we're looking for. We're not, we're not looking for anything other than what creation is all about. You know, once a few uh, of our monks were in a car, we were... Uh, I wasn't with them, but they, they were going out somewhere. They pulled up in front of a, uh, another vehicle that was in front of them, right, waiting at a red light. And the car in, in front of them had a bumper sticker on the back that read, Honk if you love Jesus. And, uh, you know, those, my generation, you know, bumper stickers were a big thing. That was like our social media back then, I think, you know. So, you know? And, uh, you know, maybe they're still common. I, I, I'm not sure. I think less so, but... In any case, you know, they, were, you know, they came up, you know, this person waiting in front, they saw the bumper sticker, honk if you love Jesus, and they thought, well, we love Jesus. And so they, the monk driving, you know, leaned on the horn a couple of times, and, and then the, the fellow in front, he rolled down the window, took his fist and said, hey, you idiots, can't you see there's a red light here, you know? So, it's like, okay, sorry, you know, it's, uh, you know, I was thinking either we should get out more or not at all. We're just, you know, to, you know it's sort of just trouble wherever we, wherever we go. And I think we, we, they only assumed that he must have been driving a friend's car or, you know, or, or, you know, forgot about the bumper sticker. All right, so uh, now we have our passage today from the Hindu Bible, the Bhagavad Gita. And this is uh, chapter 4, verse 16, which reads, Even the wise 
are confused about action and inaction. Therefore, I will explain what constitutes true action, a knowledge that will free thee from evil. And our guru comments on this passage. He says, even sages who have attained some communion with spirit become identified with the senses again after their ecstatic state is gone and thus remain bewildered as to what is right action. Our guru said, a saint who can retain his ecstatic state in the midst of activities is the doer of right actions or God-directed actions. Only actions performed with divine consciousness may be considered right actions. Actions performed with ego consciousness are wrong actions or karma involving actions. And our guru goes on, in the egoistic state, even wise men become bewildered about the distinction between right action and wrong action. The yogi in the egoistic state begins to identify himself with the bodily conditions and impulses. Thus misled, he acts wrongly in accordance with the dictates of the senses. The difference between good action and ill action can be recognized if one keeps a constant vigil during the wakeful state. And our guru gives an example here. He says, for example, a hungry, a hungry yogi begins to eat a meal. And in parentheses, our guru says, uh, adds nothing wrong here. But as he eats, his mind becomes concentrated on the taste. And then our guru adds, dangerous curves ahead. <laughs> Finally, he overeats. That is, incurs a karmic debt to nature. Thus, even a wise man may forget to distinguish the almost indivisible dividing line between self-controlled eating and uncontrolled eating, and in general, between soul-identified actions and body-identified actions. You know, in this passage reminded me how some of you may have heard uh, or know, you know, our guru, he, he enjoyed food. He enjoyed cooking and uh, being a, a gracious host. And, and, uh, uh, and so he would say, enjoy food. There's nothing wrong with it. We need it to nourish this body. But he would say, eat food, enjoy food. But then he would say, but don't let the food eat you. And that, again, it's, it's a, if somebody wants a, um, um, a relatable uh, definition of yoga, that's yoga. Don't let the food eat us. Don't let things eat us, eat at us, control us. That's the power, the real power of self-control, of control, of using our will, controlling ourselves. It's nothing to do about controlling others or the environment. It's about that, that personal power to choose what is for our highest good. And so our, our guru concludes his comments and he says, all the evils and miseries of human existence begin when the soul forgets to use the body and the senses as its instruments and servants. When the soul becomes identified with the body, its consciousness is turned senseward, away from the intuitive perception of truth. After once attaining ecstasy and communion with God, all devotees must try their utmost to be conscious of the divine state even during the egoistic or human state. This steady centering of the consciousness will preclude all confusion between good and bad actions. And so I was thinking that the point is we are the author of the story of our life. We write it, no one else with our thoughts, our, our feelings, our actions, our reactions, all the choices that we make. And like uh, in the beginning of that great Bhagavad Gita, at the end of each day, we can ask ourselves, well, what story did I write today? You know, did I like the story? I'm the author. Are there parts of it that I, I wasn't too pleased with, like to go back and, well, tomorrow I'll edit it. You know, what can I do differently? the next day, in, in the sense, or in other words, asking ourselves, you know, what do I really want in life? What do I really want? Do we know? What do I want to do with this power that I have? 
Or if I had infinite power, what would I do with it? What do I, I want to do with my life? And then if we know what that is, then what are the steps to accomplish that? How do we attain that? And then the real question is, am I willing to do what it takes to attain what I really want to do with this incarnation, what I really want to do? Not from any kind of beating on ourselves or guilt, but because of the, again, the joy, the aspiration. Of, and our Guru says we should hold before us the great things that we really want to accomplish in life. Let that draw us forward and remind us of, of what we want to do what we want to do with this great gift of life, this amazing, this talk about a miracle. It's what we, how, how is this even happening? <laughs> how are we able to, to, to feel life, to, to be able to communicate, for me to talk, for you to listen, for us to be here, for us to see all this? It's just, it's, it's beyond comprehension, but not beyond our scope to appreciate and enjoy and, and want to go deeper and feel more of. And so to round out our subject today, I thought to end by synthesizing out three points from our Guru's teachings that can be combined perhaps into a kind of formula to, as our Guru said, unleash infinite powers and shatter our finite trials. And the first of these is to meditate and pray like we did at the beginning of the service And as the scripture readings say, to meditate and pray so that we might harness and attune our will with the divine will. And then as we act, as our guru taught, there are in effect two types of self-directed action. There's willpower, as we know, but he also said there's wound power. And then lastly, as he would say, to will and act until victory. So I'll just take these three briefly. That first point, uh, our guru gave many different examples or techniques for doing this, about attuning ourselves with, with the infinite first, before we use our will, before we go out and act. And one example is as follows. He said, mentally broadcast this truth, my father and I are one, until you feel his overpowering, all solacing bliss. When this happens, you have made the contact. Then affirm your celestial right by praying, Father, I am thy child. I will reason, I will will, I will act. But guide thou my reason, will, and activity to the right thing that I should do in order to acquire health, wealth, peace, and wisdom. Again, those are are not outer objects. Those are inner objects attributes, and soul qualities. And he ended and said, feel the presence of God first, then use your will and act. With his guidance, you will be sure to harness your will and activity to the right goal. So again, first meditate and pray, connect our will with the divine will. And then the second point, as he mentioned, he spoke of, or as mentioned, he spoke of two kinds of action as we go forth to bring about those worthwhile goals and ambitions. And he said, the first is wound power, which is necessary to avoid the things which you shouldn't do. Meaning, again, those things that won't lead to the success that we're after. And he said about this, if you do not cultivate the power to reject unwholesome temptations of the senses, which will harm you physically, mentally, spiritually, then you are foolish. He said, why would you want to drink poisoned honey? If you know it is poisoned, why should you drink it, he says. And he explained, evil is poisoned honey. It may taste sweet at first, but brings suffering in the end. Anything you do that hurts the harmony of your inner being is wrong. And that's really the definition of of evil, is is anything that that disrupts the harmony that we're seeking, that, that inner harmony of ourself, our inner being. And he said, to ensure enduring happiness, you should have that self-control by which you can say no, and it stays no. And I saw on another occasion, he said, related to this, he said, all great men and women are full of no's. 
And in fact, he, he said in that same talk, he said, they have said many more no's than yeses in their life. And he added, that is what sets them apart from everyone else. And we may not think that, we may not see that, we just see the, again, the, the, you know, what they've attained and, oh, I can never be that or what we might want to be. But, well, it took a lot of no's to, to stay on their course. And so continuing with that first Part of the quote, our master said, the first kind of self-control is wound power. And the other kind, as we know, is willpower. To resolve, he said, to do certain things and to be able to carry out those resolutions with continuous activity until the goal is accomplished. Which leads to that third and last point and the slogan, so to speak, that our guru used to describe to describe that devotee who goes on no matter what the obstacles are to unite their life and goals with God's infinite power. And that is where he would say, will and act until victory. Never give up. Rouse that all-conquering courage, he would say. On another occasion in a New Year's talk, he said that we should affirm to ourselves, danger and I were born together. And I am the elder brother, the elder sister, more dangerous than danger. It's like, you know, Johnny Danger, you know, J Janie Danger. We're the elder brother, the elder sister, more dangerous than danger. Fortunately, these are his words, not my words. So, you know, so they could be my words, but uh, I'm glad that uh, they're his words. I, I, I really relate to that. So in closing, I was recalling how a few weeks ago I was, I was watching one of the online services this time by Brother Ritsananda, where he quoted what many of us will be, might be familiar with, the so-called near-death experiences of those who crossed over a, a part way, but then returned. And if you're familiar with some of those uh, stories and experiences, you'll know that there seems to be a theme that runs through the vast majority of them. And, and what the, it seems to be the overriding lesson that they bring back into their lives and that they share through that experience that they have. And that is that the value of everything comes down to our ability to be kind and our ability to love and to receive love. Nothing more complicated than that. Nothing more powerful and far-reaching than that because in the most wild and wonderful way, that's all that all this is about. All the scriptures, all the saints, they just, they proclaim that same one truth. It's just about that experience of ecstatic divine love, of joy, of happiness. And that the whole substance of creature is made out of that one substance of love. You know, tomorrow uh, happens to be the anniversary of what would have been the birthday of our former president, Sri Dayamata, who, as we know, often spoke about this exact thing, probably in every talk that she ever gave. And so I thought her words would be a fitting end to our service today and to remind us once again of the ultimate reason and purpose behind our using and uniting our will with God's infinite power. And she said, when we reach the end of this journey of life, Divine Mother will not ask what our position has been, what others have thought of us, what great deeds we have done, or even what mistakes we have made. Her only question will be, have you loved me? And have you given my love to others? And Dayama concluded her words and said, to seek anything else is to chase the shadows of dreams. So why don't we just uh, meditate for a few moments and, and let these words go deep into our consciousness. Imagining ourselves before the great mother of the universe asking us, have you loved me and did you share my love with others? And realizing that all else is to chase the shadows of dreams.
Now, before we close, let's take a few moments to pray for others. And on the subject of uniting our will with God's infinite power, and I was looking through Guruji's, our master's teachings, I saw where he said once, practice releasing will into the cosmos. And that not only means our own intention for what we want to receive, but I was thinking as it relates to praying for others, it's also a description of what we want to do when we pray. It's a definition or an explanation of prayer. And then as we will practice our, one of our Guru's healing techniques for sending out that divine will, that divine force into the cosmos. So let's take a few moments to pray deeply for those in need, of course, for our families and dear ones. You know, for our congregation here, our spiritual brothers and sisters. And then for our, our nation and for our world. Expand those prayers out into the cosmos. That those who are in need might be helped and healed. Now please stand, we'll practice one of our Guru's healing techniques. And again, in case anyone is here today is not familiar with, with the, the technique, we'll practice simply put like those fish were surrounded in a sea of cosmic energy. And so through our, through our love, through our concentration, our attention, through our will, we try to tune in with that healing power and then send it to others. We invoke the power of the Holy Ghost, the power of that Om vibration. And our hands and arms that are raised act like antenna. And we know, again, if we look at the universality of what we're doing, of what we do in Self-Realization Fellowship, you know, all the religions, they talk about the power of healing through hands, laying on of hands. In the healing arts, so much energy can be transmitted through the hands. Even just a simple pat on the back by somebody who cares for us conveys so much energy, so much comfort, so much power and love. And so in the same way, we send out that healing power through our upraised arms and hands to those in need. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, Thou art omnipresent. Thou art in all Thy children. Thou art in me. Manifest thy healing presence in the bodies, minds, and souls of all those who need divine help. Let's raise the arms and send out healing vibrations for the body. Om. For the mind. Om. For the healing of soul ignorance. Om. And for peace throughout the world. Om. Let's pray, Heavenly Father. Mother, friend, beloved God, Jesus Christ, Bhagavan Krishna, Mahavatar Babaji, Lahiri Mahashai, Swami Sri Yukteswar, our Guru, Paramahansa Yogananda, 
saints of all religions, we bow to you all. Beloved God, may your love shine forever on the sanctuary of our devotion. And may we be able to awaken your love in all hearts. Om. Peace. Amen. May God and Guru bless us all and bless our efforts to unite our will with that divine will, our love with his love and our joy with his infinite bliss. Jai Guru.